Well, small group leader, how you doing? This is week number seven of our weekly training to help coach you as you launch out in your daily transformation journal fellowship Bible study. This week, as you're preparing for this week, uh, you're going to be doing the Lord's Supper during your small group meeting. You're going to be learning about that. But some practical things you need to do is simply you need to have some bread and juice. Let me speak moment, uh, just a moment to this. There's a number of people who are now gluten-free uh, in the United States. Uh, they've discovered that they have food sensitivities or allergies to it. So you might consider using rice crackers. Maybe no one in your group has an issue with that. Maybe some people want to do Ezekiel bread. You can make a fresh loaf of bread. But uh, crackers are simple. And then also uh, you want to have some grape juice available. I would recommend small little cups or you can use glasses or whatever. L let me just speak really quickly uh, to the sensitivity to not use wine. I know that many people grew up in a culture where wine was not an issue. Certainly not taking wine maybe at church as far as the Lord's Supper. There are denominations that do that. We don't know the issues that people are facing and we don't want to be a stumbling block. And so the last thing we want to do is is uh, do the Lord's Supper with someone who struggles with being an alcoholic. So just simply do grape juice. You'll save yourself a lot of heartache. As you're as you're moving down to this seventh week, you, you really need to be doing some planning with your apprentice and your host home. If you have not had a powwow where the three of you sat down together and just to evaluate the life of your group and how it's going, I would encourage you to, to work at doing that this week. So what you want to do is you want to sit down and ask them their opinions of how they think the group is going. I mean, they're the best people to talk to. So one of the things you want to ask is, do you believe that everyone in your group is now a follower of Jesus? If not, how do you address that? And, and this is one of those things that you need to address outside the group time. So you'd want to schedule a meeting, uh, same gender. Let's have a cup of coffee and, and, and visit the idea of, you know, where are they with their journey with Jesus? Have they crossed the line with Jesus? What are the hurdles to that? Things like that. Then the other thing you want to do is you want to ask, are people sharing Jesus? I mean, as, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we are all called to make disciples. It's a mandate given to us by Jesus. It's the thing that he's going to hold us accountable for. When you look at his parables, you discover that he is going to come back and he's going to see if we were faithful stewards with what he asked us to do. And he asks us in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples. That is a command. It is a mandate from God. Now, that's not to say it's supposed to be legalistic. It's not to say that it's mechanical. It is done out of a place of love and concern for people. So the question is, are, are, you, are you cultivating a culture where your people are talking about sharing Jesus out of a place of love and concern for the world around them? The second thing you want to ask is, is anyone using their journal to do their prayer time and their daily Bible reading? Yeah, it's really hard to disciple a new believer to do these things as they lead their friends to Christ if they themselves aren't putting these habits into their own life, number one. Number two, Jesus has commanded us to love him above all else right? And how do we cultivate that love? We've got to spend time with him by listening to him in prayer and inquiring of his will through reading his word. So you want to really cultivate this culture where people are learning to love God by spending time with him. Then the fruits of that is to love others, which is first fruits, where we begin to share our faith out of that love and also then making disciples of those folks by meeting with them outside group time, by starting our own groups or meeting one-on-one -on -one with someone that we're discipling. And I just want to remind you that, um, and th this is something that is a kind of a helpful thought, that as you're coaching your small group members, the journal uh, is used forward for someone that's already a Christian. And for someone who you're reaching to come to know Christ, you do the journal backwards. Watch this. Remember, it's listen, inquire, fellowship, express. So if you share Jesus with someone who doesn't know, that's express, right? So after you share Jesus with them, the next thing after they accept Christ is then you invite them to the fellowship group, group right? And then after they join this fellowship group, you want to encourage them to start reading their Bible daily and start praying daily. Now, if a person's already a believer and they want to grow at becoming a disciple of Jesus, then you do the journal forward, L-I-F-E, listen, inquire, fellowship, express. I want to ask you to visit with your apprentice and your host home about how the 90-second testimony thing is going. Are, are you guys, you know, doing a good job of remembering people to, to, to include people and asking them to do it every week? Are, they, are you run out of people that are willing to do it? How do you address that? 
I mean, how you address that is you just have to coach those people who haven't done it yet. They need help outside the group. That's why they haven't done it yet is because they need you to, to shepherd them and to teach them how to do it. And you do that outside a group. So I encourage you, again, meet one-on-one, -on -one, same gender, and try to coach some of those folks that haven't done their testimony yet. Then ask the question, what can we do as a group to improve? I mean, we look at the church circle and the 10 things that we're to do. How are we doing at those 10 things? But are there other things that we need to address? Are there difficult people that you need to talk about? And how you help help move them along to, to become a more vital part of the group. And then, of course, as I talked last week, sometimes there are people in our group that are, that are wolves. They're not interested in knowing Jesus. They're not interested in going to growing in Jesus. They're just a distraction, and they keep the group from being safe. And if you don't get rid of the wolf, the sheep will scatter. So you've got to address it. It's hard to do, but it's, not, it's a lot easier to do if you guys will work together on this. Ask the host home, do you need some help? How's it going? Are you getting tired of doing all the refreshments? Is the sign-up sheet process going? Hey, what about the social? Is that, how's that going? How's the child care going? Anything we can do to support you? Because you don't want that host to feel alone, right? And then ask the apprentice how they think they're doing. How do they think the lead leadership of the group is going? Do they want more responsibility? Are they ready to start thinking about launching their group? Because it's not too soon to start thinking about that. Is there, is there a potential apprentice? or host that you see in our group that you could take and ask them to join you to start your own group one day. And you begin to pray about that and, and maybe even begin to have some of those initial conversations. Well, this week's passage, I mentioned to you already, is we're going to be dealing, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And so it's appropriate that we talk about that value. Now, when you look at the church circle, of the 10 things that a healthy church does. One of those things is the Lord's Supper, right? It's the picture of the of the goblet and the bread. If you are part of a church, the question is, is does your church, does your does your church allow your small group to have the Lord's Supper in their meeting time? And if you don't know the answer to that, have a, have a conversation with your pastor. And if you can't do it in your group, then the thing you want to do is you want to let people know when the Lord's Supper is being held in your church. And then you just at, you just promote that to your small group saying, hey, if you want to be part of Lord's Supper, we're going to be doing it this Sunday. Now let's go and do it together. We can sit together as a small group and then that way we can have our Lord's Supper experience there. But many churches will allow you to do the Lord's Supper in your small group time. And so the question is, how do you do that? The most extensive teaching on the Lord's Supper is actually done by the Apostle Paul as he writes to the Church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So I encourage you to look that over, but that's a very unique set of circumstances because what was going on in that church was is that there were a lot of there were some wealthy people in the church, um, and then there were very poor people, maybe likely even slaves, who were born again believers, all part of this house church. But because of um, position in society, what was happening is the rich people were, were gluttons and drunkards, and there was nothing left for the poorer people at the end. And so Paul has to correct them, saying that they need to eat before they come, so that way there's food for everyone. And that because they're choosing to take the Lord's Supper in an inappropriate way, that might explain why some of you guys are sick. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But let me look at two. today's Bible study portion is going to be found in Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 20, which is the longest expression out of the Gospels of the Lord's Supper. Then came to the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, so that we may eat it. They said to him, Where, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of that house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room? Where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and they found it just as he told them. And they prepared the Passover. Verse 14. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you 
is the new covenant in my blood. Very intimate time. Could you imagine Jesus there with his disciples? Say, I'm not going to drink this vine, from this vine again until we're united. He's like, I'm going to fast from this until we're together again. I love you that much. I'm going to miss you. And I want you to know that I'm going to miss you. But I'm asking you to partake of it often so that you'll remember me. Hmm. I encourage you to ask those six questions. What do you learn about God from that? Here's intimacy. Here is love. Hear them trying to help them understand still that he's going to die even though they don't believe it. What do you learn about man? Oh, we're dense. We don't get it. His disciples who are hanging out with Jesus for three years, listening to him, anointed to do miracles, are still struggling with trusting him and understanding. Right? We're slow. Is there a sin to avoid? Yeah. Neglecting our walk with God. You know, minimizing what God's instructions are to us, right? Not taking the Lord's Supper in a way that really honors Jesus and the sacrifice he gave us. Is there a command to obey? Yeah. We're to do this. We're to eat and to drink often to remember, to not forget what Jesus has done for us. When you're in a small home church where the Lord's Supper was actually an entire meal, they they began the dinner, um, with, with the bread where they would pray and break the bread and then they would eat the meal. And after the meal, they would clear the dishes and they would have a time where they would read a psalm or sing a song. And then they would spend time reading scripture, studying it, reading letters that were being passed around, having this study together. Then they would pray for each other. And then they'd finish the night with the cup to remember that the covenant and the relationship with God is sealed, right? That was, so, so the Lord's Supper was was an entire meeting. It was their entire meeting in a home. It was their home group every week. So then what if there's something wrong between members of the group? Well, we're expected to make that right. We're, we're commanded to leave our gift at the altar. Don't Before you go and make sacrifices to God, you know, go if you know a brother has, has a sin, has been offended by you, and go and make it right. Preserve the unity. You know, make sure that there's no sin in your life, no offense that's separating you and the Father. So the Lord's Supper, uh, I always spend time reflecting before God. Give you and the members of your group time to reflect. Lord, is there any wicked way in me? Is there something that's separating my walk with you? Is there something you want me to address? And wait, confess. If his word to you is he just affirms you and he loves you, then celebrate that. Praise the Lord for that, right? I hope these things were helpful for you today and trust that God's going to bless you as you meet with your group tonight.